Yeah, how wealth rules the world, saving our communities and freedoms from the dictatorship of property. Now, property is central to the discussion in the book, and there are different types of property, and we'll get into those just kind of superficially tonight uh, and a little bit more deeply in the next um, section. The way that the, the book and the presentation of it here on Zoom is broken up, uh, it's into one chapter at a time. Uh, tonight is actually the introduction. And the introduction is sort of an overview, and so it'll capture some of the general themes um, that uh, are covered in more detail throughout the book. So this is a good place to start, I think. And I, I think I'd like to begin by just mentioning a little bit about um, why I wrote it. Why did I write a book like this? And it's not the kind of a book, quite frankly, that I would normally have thought about writing uh, in past years. Um, it covers a fair amount of history. It covers a fair amount of the history of law and the development of law in the United States. Um, and they're not topics that I really focused on or showed a lot of interest in when I was in school. Um, but what I found when I started working with the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, uh, and that was in the capacity of a community organizer. When I began to work with people in their communities who would call and ask how we might help them to stand up against a proposed project, usually a corporate project, uh, that looked like it was going to have an impact on their quality of life, on their local natural environment, um, on their health and safety. And they would come and they would say, well, what can we do? We've approached our elected officials and uh, all we get from them is that they can't help us. They, they wish they could, but their hands are tied. The law says that they can't say no to the project that's being um, proposed. Uh, that um, was something that I had some familiarity with when I got involved in organizing, I had been working, uh, well, as an activist um, for years before I came to sell that. And one of the areas of concern that I had uh, was with the way that corporate money and large fortunes were being brought to the electoral process and were determining the outcome of elections. And beyond that, how that same kind of money was being brought uh, into the legislative process and how lobbyists were not only um, funding the campaigns of uh, the elected officials, but were drafting legislation <clears throat> that was then introduced into um, Congress and into state legislatures and being enacted into law when in fact it was industries that we thought would, would be subject to regulation that were writing the regulations oftentimes, that were writing the laws um, and in doing so, limiting the amount of regulation that actually existed or could be enforced. One thing I was familiar with uh, before I even got involved with uh, organizing with CELDEF was the power of corporations in particular, the notion of corporations as corporate persons, corporate property as having Bill of Rights protections. That was a concept that when I first heard about it back in, I think, maybe the early 1990s, and I started doing some research into that, um, really had me scratching my head and wondering, how can we have a democratic system? How can we have democratic lawmaking and elections if accumulations of wealth can have such a strong and, and overbearing impact on the outcomes of elections and the kinds of laws that are being created and enforced. When I, even before I came to CELDEF, um, I knew about Richard Grossman. I'm not sure if uh, folks here are familiar with Richard Grossman. He passed away a few years back, 
Um, he was really a mentor of ours uh, on staff at SELDEF in the early years, 2003, 2004, when I started. Uh, and um, he was, we, we referred to him as our staff historian. And I got uh, a really good start on understanding um, the history of corporate rights and how the Supreme Court had stepped in on behalf of accumulated wealth, recognizing extra privileges, extra constitutional protections um, for accumulations of wealth that were then chartered as corporations. Um, and as a matter of fact, I had published a newsletter for a number of years with um, uh, a friend of mine um, that where we, we reprinted a lot of Richard Grossman's materials, uh, information from POCLAD, the program on corporations, law and democracy, and essentially trying to um, alert people to the idea that corporations have such an, well, a, a, a overwhelming effect on our political structures and frankly, on our ability to make decisions for our own communities. So when I came to um, CELDEF, what I found was people asking me, how can we possibly stand up against, for instance, um, Cinegro Corporation in Pennsylvania uh, that was um, distributing urban sewage sludge and passing it off to farmers as free fertilizer for the food crops and their um, the crops for their animals. Uh, and it was being permitted by the federal EPA and okayed by the State Department of Environmental Protection. That was one of the first encounters I had uh, with people saying to me, the corporation says, if we say you can't do this to us, we'll be sued the municipality will be sued for violating the rights, and that is the civil rights of the corporate person. Um, that didn't seem to make a lot of sense to me. And I wanted to dive in and find out where this structure of law, this idea came from. And that's what led me down the road to finally uh, putting this book together because it covers a whole lot more than uh, corporate personhood and corporate constitutional rights. Um, it covers things like state preemption, that is when the state forbids municipalities and counties from enacting laws that would protect the community from corporate, corporate projects that the state has issued permits for and has declared to be legal, even though the people who have to live with the outcome um, find those activities to be harmful, even dangerous. Uh, preemption is something that we'll be talking about uh, a fair amount. And Dillon's rule, the idea that the state is in every way superior to the municipality, to the local government, and that the people living in their communities essentially have no right of local self-government. That the local government that's been established by the state is property of the state and will follow the dictates of the state. and cannot be used by the, the community that lives within its jurisdiction as a tool for democratic self-government at the local level. That seemed to me to be at odds with what I understood was the purpose of breaking away from the British Empire, um, setting up uh, and establishing self-governing communities. I mean, after all, uh, when the the colonists broke away. They didn't have state governments. They didn't have federal governments. They had local governments. And it was those governments that they insisted should be able to be self-governing and have democratic authority to make decisions on everything that affected them directly. And they were being refused that authority by the king. And for those reasons, we'll get into that um, later on in, in future uh, installments of the book, in future chapters um, into a, a lot more detail about what the revolutionaries thought about local self-government and how it is that today municipalities and the people who live within their jurisdiction are no better off than they were before the American Revolution when it comes to self-determination. One of the things that um, 
that I, I had to explore was the Constitution and its sources and who wrote it and why and what was the reasoning behind certain aspects of that Constitution uh, that, that um, highlighted commercial interests. We have the Commerce Clause. We have the Contracts Clause. We have the Fugitive Labor Clause. We have lots of things in the Constitution that look like they're more of a, um, a, a kind of a, a free trade agreement between the states more so than a governing document uh, for a democratic people. Uh, we'll get into that. And these are things that I had to um, really spend some time researching to understand. And hopefully I can lay that out for, uh, for you to um, have a, a, a better picture of really the situation we find ourselves in today, where we want to protect our local environments and we're told that we can't do that if it gets in the way of commercial interests. Um, and therein um, lies the connection with property um, that um, is, I mentioned in the title of the book. I wanna pause for a moment and um, I should have earlier asked if there were any questions about the logistics of things and raising your hand to ask questions and so forth and putting things in the chat. Um, there is, if you put your cursor at the bottom of the black frame here, you'll see at the bottom, there's a icon for chat. If you click on that to the right, uh, the area will open up for chat and you'll be able to type in comments and questions there. And again, we'll try to get to those comments and questions. And thank you to David and Dee for keeping an eye on those things. Um, I'm, I'm going to just talk a little bit more and then do a little bit of a reading that covers kind of an over, overview of the book um, this is the introductory section, uh, and that will take maybe 10 minutes, and then we'll go to questions and answers. But I think I want to be able to summarize um, things for you and open up the conversation. But I'm not sure how I do this. David and Dee, I'm interested to know. Um, we can do it this way. Let's test your use of the raised hand. And you can then you have to unraise it after you've raised it, okay? But go to the reactions on the bottom and raise your hand if you read uh, part one in preparation for tonight's conversation. <laughs> can you do that? Raise your hand. And it's a test of finding the raised hand part too, so. Well. It's not bad. Okay. Um, well, I'll also not feel so bad about um, reading a little bit to you uh, in terms of a summary of the book, an overview of the book. Um, go back to your uh, reactions and you'll see uh, raise hand and then lower hand. So you can go ahead and lower your hand at this point unless you have a question that needs to be answered right now, if you do. Brianna, do you have a question? No. And if you do want to speak, you'll need to also unmute yourself if you're called on to for your question. All right. Um, so I mentioned the Federalists, uh, and I'm going to talk about those folks. Um, they were generally not uh, the folks who met the Redcoats on the field of battle during the American Revolution. Um, that's not um, fully the case. Certainly, George Washington, uh, a Federalist, was there. He was the, the uh, commanding general. Um, and his aide, um, Alexander Hamilton, was there. But quite frankly, most of the Federalists who met in Philadelphia in 1787 to draft a constitution, uh, they were um, essentially uh, mostly lawyers, uh, men of means, uh, people who owned a fair amount of property, and a large number of enslaved um, African-Americans. 
um, in, in many cases. And so they were of a different point of view and from the folks who were calling for a radical change in the society in North America, away from hierarchical um, governance as was found in the British system, away from aristocracy, um, away from, frankly, property requirements for being involved in voting and for holding public office. Um, and so the Federalists, um, they came from a background of, of learning, of, of uh, being steeped in the British common law uh, and understanding that structure of society. Uh, and they were fairly well attached to it. And I say these things not just because I have an opinion, um, but because the Federalists themselves uh, spoke these words and wrote them down uh, when they were meeting in Philadelphia to draft the Constitution, James Madison and Robert Yates, uh, James Madison from Virginia, Yates from New York, kept um, detailed notes um, from every day of the, of the gathering in Philadelphia at what we call Constitution Hall now. Uh, and um, some of those notes are very revealing about their motivations and what, what it was uh, that they wanted to create when it came to uh, forming a new plan for government. And we'll get into this again later, but uh, they weren't simply starting from scratch. They had a constitution already enacted on the books, and it was called the Articles of Confederation. And it was a plan of governance. It was a not the same as the current constitution, of course, the Federalist Constitution. It, uh, the Articles of Confederation set up a, a loose confederacy, almost like a NATO, if you will, of North American colonies, uh, where they promised um, mutual defense and aid in case of invasion, um, also in case of insurrection. And when they said insurrection, um, they were uh, referring to things like uh, the, the revolts of enslaved peoples. Um, that were fairly common, as well as the revolts of, uh, of folks um, in particularly in New England, um, in the Carolinas, um, that were revolting against taxation policies of the new nation. Uh, and um, that was something that the Federalists were very concerned about, and they included language to address it and to empower the states to assist each other to put down internal insurrections as well. Um, and again, we'll talk about these things in more detail in future installments. But just to say that the, the notes that James Madison kept um, are very revealing of the attitudes of the Federalists and what they intended to do. Uh, they, the, uh, and, and we'll read from some of them um, in the future. One, though, that stands out in my mind um, is Madison talking about what form of government needed to be created. Uh, Hamilton came prepared with uh, what was called the New York Plan, and it proposed a limited monarchy, not a republic, um, not a democracy, but a monarchy um, with a, uh, an executive who could be impeached. Um, but uh, was to take office for life otherwise. Um, Madison's was the Virginia plan. And he said that it needed to create a system of government that protected the interests of the opulent against the interests of the majority. And so wealth needed to be protected against um, the democratizing instincts of uh, the majority of the people. And that was very much underlying the plan for government that he put forward as the Virginia plan. Um, these are things that I came to understand as I researched and tried, and tried to come to grips with what was stopping communities from protecting themselves from things like fracking and pipelines and toxic waste dumps and you name it, uh, what 
what was it that authorized our judiciary to stand up for and defend the interest of the opulent? And it goes back to Madison and it goes back to the folks in that conclave in Philadelphia, which was, by the way, a secret gathering. Um, the shades were pulled down around the windows. There were armed guards on the porch around the building. Uh, it was not something what I grew up in Philadelphia and I had this image of it being um, a, a, just a miraculous gathering of modern philosophers um, who had the best interests of the common people at heart. And that's what they were there to decide on how to govern in the best way, in the most just way possible. And, it, and I found it shocking um, to be um, separated from that fantasy. And that um, is something that I hope won't be too disturbing to you if you've not encountered um, the facts of, of the matter as I'm planning to share them with you. Um, we continue to have more folks joining us. And I'll just say um, greetings to everybody. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, and Ben, we, we have a question in the chat. Why did they meet in secret? Um, the fact is that what they had to say would not have been welcome news to the folks who just fought the Redcoats, as they called them. Um, the secrecy, and there's a real story involved here, and I think I'm gonna be saving it for next month probably, um, but it involves partly the reason that George Washington, a British general um, who was an officer during the French and Indian War, uh, fought for the British, um, created quite a reputation um, as a warrior for himself during that, um, and also gathered to himself uh, claims to large um, acreages of land out in what is now Western Pennsylvania and Eastern Ohio, um, something along the lines of um, 67,000 acres of land that he brought, um, that he had a claim to. The story of how he came to that, I'll say for later, it's a little appalling, um, but um, he was um, also very concerned that he would lose his claims to that land um, if uh, he were not um, part of this call for independence. Um, that being the case, because the British had signed a treaty um, with uh, indigenous Americans um, saying that they would not support, uh, protect, or allow settlers to um, settle beyond to the west of the Allegheny Mountains, the Appalachians, in other words, um, and that no land claims uh, west of those mountains would be recognized by the crown. Um, well, that's certainly where Washington's land was, uh, his claims were. And that had something, I would say, to do with his interest in independence. Um, other folks who met in Philadelphia in secret um, were part of a plan um, to build a canal system along the Potomac River uh, in order to move lumber and coal and other um, resources out of the west of Pennsylvania and uh, the east of Ohio that had been claimed uh, during those um, war years, French and Indian War. Uh, and um, those, uh, that, that plan for the, for the uh, canal system uh, would not have come to fruition without there being an independence from the British Empire. Uh, there had to be a recognition of the Potomac Company, an incorporation of that of that company, uh, recognized by the states. Um, they were um, that was. It's another story that we'll get into. But why did they meet in secret? Partly because they had secrets to keep, and partly because, as um, as Dickinson uh, said. Uh, and is recorded to have said by Madison in his notes um, that if we all we all agree, all the all the Federalists in the room at the time, we all agree uh, that the British system of government is the best the world has ever seen. In other words, a monarchy and a hierarchical aristocratic system of governance. Uh, but um, he said, 
uh, the, the tenor of the times wouldn't allow us to propose such a government. And what did he mean by that? Well, he means that the commoners had just fought the British, the most powerful empire on the planet, uh, and had won their independence. And it was very unlikely they were going to just put their muskets down peacefully and allow the Federalists to impose a new monarchy on them. And so that was um, a serious discussion uh, within the, the halls of what we call Constitution Hall. Um, and it was a real concern of the Federalists. Um, it's interesting that some anti-Federalists who uh, we know the names of like Patrick Henry, um, like Thomas Jefferson particularly, Thomas Jefferson was not there in Philadelphia. Um, he had been sent over to France uh, to play a dip diplomatic role. I, I like to imagine you know, an alternate history if uh, Jefferson had been there in Philadelphia, what some of the arguments might have sounded like. Um, it would have probably been quite a different uh, sound coming out of that place. Um, there were certainly some disagreements and there were certainly some compromises that we'll get into, for instance, between the northern and the southern states um, that empowered the southern states in ways that we would, we would find uh, appalling today. And I'm going to talk about those in a little bit, too. Um, and so, yeah, the secrecy was to make sure they weren't uh, run off track. Uh, when um, the proposed Constitution was put forward to the, the legislatures of the states uh, for approval, for ratification, uh, it did not look promising for the new Constitution. The Anti-Federalist, which I'm not sure how many folks have read too much about them, but the folks who opposed adoption of this new proposed constitution um, were numerically in the majority. Uh, and uh, But they did not own the presses. Um, that was one thing they had working against them. Sort of like the 99% and the 1% today, you know, um, who owns the presses? Well, not the 99%. And so whose voice gets heard the loudest? Well, not the 99%. Um, the anti-federalists in the state legislatures had to be persuaded uh, that there would, um, they would not lose rights with adoption of this new proposed constitution. And they were gonna vote against it until they got a guarantee that there would be a bill of rights amended to the constitution as soon as possible uh, after ratification. Uh, and that's, by the way, why we had the first 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights, because the anti-federalists said, no deal. We won't support ratification of your proposal if we don't get a guarantee of certain rights. Um, it's a longer story. There were more than 10 that were proposed. There were about 50 of them that were sent um, to the framers, to Madison particularly, uh, and it was whittled down to 10. Um, and, and a fair number of those pertain to protecting property, not person. Uh, and we'll get into that as well. Yeah, Ben, uh, yes. um, a extension of the question, whose idea was it to meet and start this process? I think you answered part of that, but uh, maybe you have something more to add. Right. Uh, well, um, there were gatherings prior to it uh, in, in Maryland, as a matter of fact, um, and so um, prior to it, the, the first gathering to, a couple of years before 1787 um, was uh, among what were delegates, delegates from the various states um, to the Continental Congress uh, who were wanting to put that, uh, I mentioned the canal system along the Potomac together, and they wanted to charter the Potomac Corporation. The Potomac Corporation uh, was needed in order to um, do the work. It's why people incorporate um, today. The corporation was a, a different animal back then, but they wanted the incorporation. Um, the, the investors in the Potomac Corporation were frustrated because after 10 years of appealing to Virginia and Maryland legislatures, uh, for the right to form the Potomac Company, and they needed both legislatures to approve it. 
since the canal would be adjacent to both sovereign states of Virginia and Maryland. Uh, it wasn't like we have today where the states were part of a larger nation. They, it was an alliance essentially of sovereign states. And the investors in the Potomac Corporation uh, were very frustrated. They gathered together and they said, we need to amend the Articles of Confederation to make it easier uh, for interstate commerce to go forward so that we, that when there's something that uh, a form of trade um, that crosses state boundaries, it isn't quite so um, complex that we can do it a lot more quickly and easily uh, to get the approval. Um, and so they were proposing an amendment to the Articles of Confederation. Uh, they sent out a call um, to the delegates from all of the states to gather together in Maryland the following year. Um, and they didn't get very many. Um, they, you know, they, they had 13 um, uh, new states. Uh, they got a handful of delegates to come. So they really couldn't take any actions. And they went back to the drawing board and they said, okay, let's try again. We're putting out a new um, invitation to the delegates from the states. Let's meet in Philadelphia next year. And what we're gonna talk about is amending the constitution, that is the Articles of Confederation, um, according to um, the rules for amending that constitution. Um, so there had to be the, you know, all of the states had to be involved in this. It wasn't just a, a simple majority could amend the constitution. Um, they did, of course, get um, most of the states um, to respond. They did not get Rhode Island, even during the, the convention in Philadelphia. Rhode Island did not participate. Uh, it was not interested. Um, and uh, they also did not get all of the folks that they invited. Uh, folks that then were later identified as anti-federalist and opposed to changing the constitution, amending it uh, even, but what was actually then proposed when they met in Philadelphia was not an amendment, but an overturning of the constitution, a replacing of it. And what was the central, the kind of the centerpiece uh, for the new constitution? Um, it's kind of strange when you think about it. No, it wasn't, it wasn't the Bill of Rights. That was stuff that they didn't even talk about. That was stuff that they had to concede to later to the anti-federalists. Um, it was interstate commerce. They wanted a commerce clause. That was the main reason they wanted a central government and a commerce clause was so that uh, people with a lot of land and investments wouldn't have to ask permission of the representatives of the commoners whether they could engage in the kind of um, financial and uh, and commercial enterprise that they wanted to. Um, they didn't want to go hat in hand to the repres direct representatives of the folks out there on the farms. Uh, they thought that that was beneath them, quite frankly. Um, and they also thought that it was frustratingly too complex and that democracy was a scourge. When we go to the notes talking about uh, forming the new for the new government and the Philadelphia conclave, um, there is very little to be said positively about a democracy. There is very matter of fact, there's an awful lot to be said in a damning way about it being the worst form of government possible. And so why would they meet in secret? Why did they meet to begin with? It was because they had some things they wanted to accomplish that would not be popular. And so keeping it quiet um, seemed the best way to go about it. The Federalist Papers uh, that were published after um, the document was formed um, and as it was being shopped around to the state legislatures for approval, the Federalist Papers were written by the Federalists, of course, and they made the case for adopting this new form of government. Um, and they um, were not very responsive in a positive way to the concerns of the anti-federalists who saw, for instance, um, the, the proposed federal judiciary as having monarchical powers to overturn laws made by the direct 
representatives of the people. And they thought that that was a very bad idea and other things. Um, but I'm getting really far ahead here. Um, and I think what I'd like to do is pause for a moment. And you know, there's going to be, I'm going to probably open up more and more questions as I go. Um, and, and that's fine. Um, but I'm going to read from kind of a summary of the book and it's, you know, what's the argument that I'm making here? Uh, and um, then I'll pause and we'll open it up for a bit more of a discussion if we can. Do we, do we have anything else, um, Dee and David, that I need to address? Yeah, there's a, a question in uh, the chat. Uh, what was the public reaction to the Articles of Confederation being wholesale replaced versus amended? Presumably, this would have come as a big surprise to the public. It certainly did. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And it's not the kind of stuff that I heard in my history classes growing up. And it's not what I heard from the uh, the tour guides in Philadelphia when I went to see the Liberty Bell and Constitution Hall and the rest of it. Um, but in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, which I lived in Carlisle, Pennsylvania um, for 20 years or so uh, before moving to where I am now, um, about two hours north of there. Carlisle, Pennsylvania was kind of on the frontier of um, Pennsylvania, the, the, the wilderness, if you will, and the, the land office was there and so forth. Um, but it was a beginning to be kind of a thriving town. Um, and in Carlisle, um, the Federalists and, uh, and their folks were burned in effigy. When, when people heard about the proposal, um, there was rioting in the streets. There was a real dismay. Uh, about um, this proposal. Um, the, the thing is that the Federalists were somewhat prepared, um, knowing that, uh, that the opinions of the public would not be in favor. As a matter of fact, they say so in the notes um, kept in Philadelphia by Yates and, and by Madison, um, that uh, they did not consult the people out there that they supposedly represented. And they said, but you know, we're the wise, we're the well-educated, we know better than they do. Um, we're just going to choose um, what is the better system. Uh, and they don't know what the better system is. And they wouldn't know it if, they, if it was staring them in the face, essentially. Um, and then they prepared uh, to go out and to lobby for these things. They lobbied also with threats of tarring and feathering for folks um, who did not support ratification. Uh, the, it was not um, just a gleeful celebration of the new document. Um, there was, in many ways, I think that it probably felt like um, the atmosphere, the political atmosphere that uh, we sense today in the United States, that there were, it was polarized in a very strong way. Um, that's not what we read about, um, and it's a much nicer story to hear about everybody jumping on the bandwagon, um, but it, it ju just isn't true. And so we have to make a decision whether we prefer the lore and the legend of America or the truth. And I've sided on the truth because I don't know how to help the communities that come to me uh, for assistance in protecting their interests if I keep pretending that things are other than they really are. If I keep pretending that the law is on the side of the communities and of the commoners, and it's not. I hope that that, at least for now, kind of gives a sense of an answer to that question. Yeah, there's two more uh, comments, questions, uh, but wasn't everything a surprise to the people? And then, but with the communication of the time, Tom's found out piecemeal, and it would have been very difficult to create a united protest. Right, I think that's that, uh, that that's pretty far right. I mean, not far right. It's very right uh, in sen in the sense of, um, yeah, it caught people flat footed. They didn't expect it. Um, yeah, everybody knew that there was discontent with the Articles of Confederation, especially among the well-to-do classes that they weren't happy with it. And they kept complaining that it was 
that democracy was not a, a viable system. It was never going to last. Um, and uh, and so when this proposal came out uh, and was made public, it was accompanied by, um, you know, when I say the Federalist Papers, they came out one at a time and and they were um, they were essentially like infomercials in favor of uh, the proposed Constitution. Um, they, it, they were um, really promoting the whole idea and poo-pooing the idea that in some way this is going to be a loss of rights and authority for the people. Um, I mean, heck, the document starts with the words, we, the people of the United States. Um, of course, that's the last time that you hear about we, the people of the United States, but, you know, it's a good start. Um, there was definitely a strong um, pushback on it. So why did it get ratified? Uh, well, the folks in the state legislatures um, that were anti-federalists didn't think it was a great idea, um, were persuaded that it was the best thing to do. And frankly, they were um, they were still, although not um, farmers and real commoners, um, they were uh, kind of middle class, upper middle class, if you will. They weren't up in the uh, gentry class of the Federalists, um, but they wanted their uh, property interests to be protected as well. They just didn't want to lose their, um, their rights um, as participants in the governing structure. Um, that they thought they had gained through the revolution. And so the Bill of Rights was something that they insisted on. It's one of the questions that we're always asked is, so when the Bill of Rights was enacted a couple of years later, um, who gained rights that didn't have them already? And the answer is nobody. Women didn't get any rights from the Bill of Rights being ratified. African-Americans, slaves, enslaved people didn't. Um, Native Americans didn't. Uh, white men who didn't own property didn't gain those rights uh, because they only applied to people um, who had enough wealth to qualify um, to be covered by those rights. And that's when I get down to the idea of property um, and the dictatorship of property. Uh, that is um, part of the story here. Th did you say there was one more question? Um, if not, I'm going to um, go ahead and I'll just read for a little bit. And the reason I'm doing this, this is from the introduction of How Wealth Rules the World. And for those of you who might have the book, it starts on page four. Um, and it's under the heading um, on the PDF, if you downloaded it and read it, the heading is The Dictatorship of Property. Uh, and so it's you know, a page or two down, three pages maybe down. Um, and so here's the reason that I want to read this to you. It says, the dictatorship of property, here's my argument in a nutshell. And so we are faced with social, political, and environmental problems that resist resolution because law empowers a wealthy minority to govern based on priorities often at odds with the general welfare. The Constitution and its interpretation by the courts amounts to an arsenal of weaponized law able to deliver special privileges to, the, to a property class. Certain legal mechanisms let those seeking to profit at the public expense block policies that compete with their interests. These legal doctrines operate by a two-step process. First, they remove democratic rights from, from the public sphere and deposit them in concentrated accumulations of property. I know that's kind of a loaded statement, but I, I'll get into it here. So again, these legal doctrines operate by a two-step process. First, they remove democratic rights from the public sphere and deposit them in concentrated accumulations of property. In other words, they privatize them. The oddity of attaching legal rights to property itself rather than to people 
roared into public consciousness with the Supreme Court's 2010 Citizens United ruling that affirmed corporate property as personhood and free speech rights. Although the ruling shocked the conscience of average Americans, it was not the first time the court had vested civil rights within inert property, nor were corporations the first type of property to be given legal rights. The second step is for property imbued with rights to deliver those rights as an extra layer of legal privilege to the property owner. And so, in other words, there are certain legal rights that are attached to property, like a corporation. We're familiar with corporations, which are property um, having Bill of Rights protections attached to them. And then whoever owns and controls that corporate property, that's who benefits from those attached Bill of Rights protections, those extra privileges, because the property itself can't enjoy rights. Human beings can, living people can, living things can, but piles of money can't, piles of property can't. And so lodging uh, those legal rights, attaching them to the property, um, and then conveying those legal rights to the owner who comes into uh, to control of that property is a way of conveying extra privileges to a class of wealthy people without superficially appearing to create an aristocracy. Um, it seems pretty sneaky and it seems pretty tough to uncover, uh, but that's what I'm trying to get at in these pages. So I'm gonna read a little bit more here. When civil and human rights are deposited in property, that property is placed beyond the authority of the people to govern how it is used by its owner. When civil and human rights are deposited in property, that property is placed beyond the authority of the people to govern how it is used by its owner. So when corporations have rights, it's beyond the authority of the people to use their municipality to pass a law to govern what that corporation does in their jurisdiction because the corporation, the property itself has rights that they cannot violate. And it's the argument used by corporate attorneys every day when they approach municipal governments and tell them, if you pass this ordinance banning Project X, the pipeline, the fracking, the gold mine, the you name it, if you do that, that will be a violation of the Fifth Amendment protections um, of this corporate person, and we will sue you for a civil rights violation. Now, I'm going to read a little bit more on this. Um, as a result of this nullification of the majority's ability to decide directly and through their elected representatives what the public policy will be because they're up against these rights attached to property. As a result, we aren't allowed to resolve issues of immediate concern to every community. Even when we understand what needs to be done, we're often blocked. Privileges secured by law for an opulent minority outweigh our right to self-govern at the local level. We're left institutionally powerless when the interests of the rich conflict with settling issues like these through community lawmaking like these. So homelessness, police accountability, immigrants' rights, workers' rights on the job, living wages, fracking, retail chains water privatization, GMOs, gun regulation, school privatization, private vote tallying, corporatization of food production, prisoners' rights, prison privatization, unsustainable energy policies, private surveillance and data mining, factory farms, strip mining, predatory lending, pipelines, urban sewage sludge, toxic trespass, in other words, public poisoning, and lots of other policies. We're told at the local level that we can't approach our local officials and ask them to enact laws to say no to projects that um, would stop us from, um, from dealing with these issues or would overturn a law that does directly deal with these issues when those local laws would in some way interfere with the commercial interests 
of a corporation. Um, that's when state preemption regularly steps in. And we'll get into preemption here very shortly. A little bit, um, reading a little bit further. Our social and governing problems are rooted in the legal fiction of property. The legal fiction of property. I say legal fiction because without law, property does not exist, as we'll discuss thoroughly in the next section. For now, it's important to realize that not all property conveys the same kind of governing clout to its owner. To make this clear, I'll draw a distinction between personal property and privileged property. Personal property, as used in these pages, is derived from one's own labor. Ownership, ownership of it is understandably a cherished right. Our homes and vehicles, our wages and savings, but not returns on savings derived from interest, by the way. Um, these justly belong to each of us, meaning that we have an exclusive right to them and to control them. The right to own the fruit of one's personal effort is unalienable. Again, unalienable means intrinsic, impossible to be separated from, not able to be forfeited, sold, traded, or even voluntary, voluntarily surrendered. An unalienable right is almost like your eye color. It's just part of you. You, you, know, you don't sell your eye color. You say, no, it's just me. Um, same goes with your fundamental unalienable rights. And I said um, that property is not, when I, and we'll talk um, in uh, May, we're going to talk about property not being an unalienable right. So um, moving further uh, forward here, the right to one's personal property is part of the right of self preservation and includes the right of material security within the social context and within the natural ecosystem. Personal property is a limited category confined to what an individual can produce solely from personal effort. It may be just enough to subsist. It may be a significant treasure, but it is never accumulated at the expense of someone else's rights. Privileged property, on the other hand, is the kind of property to which the Federalists and later their quasi-monarchical Supreme Court attached legal privileges the kind of property that is not earned by personal effort. Either it is the spoils of conquest, the booty of pillaging, or the result of the enclosure, that is the privatization of the commons. Or it is the ownership of a mass property through inheritance, purchase, garnishment, or confiscation. Privileged property involves monopoly control, including the deprivation of the rights of others. It is accumulated and maintained by many mechanisms, including rationing of necessities and extortion of labor in exchange for them. Ownership of privileged property is regularly used to justify extractive activities that destroy the ability of human communities and ecosystems to sustain a healthy existence. I'm not claiming that privileged property is always used in antisocial ways. Large fortunes amassed by robber barons, real estate moguls, televangelists, and dictators are enjoyed through inheritance by their children, who sometimes apply a part of the hoard to philanthropic causes. Even when it is used for seemingly noble purposes, however, <coughs> privileged property is still the result of antisocial behavior. Pierre Joseph Proudhon, author of What is Property, that's an 1840 book, um, said that property is theft. Um, well, he was pretty broad stroked in that. I'm going to say perhaps privileged property is. The legal doctrines that institutionalize special privileges for wealthy, uh, for the wealthy, that is, include the following federal preemption of state and local commercial lawmaking privatization of public law, commoditization of unalienable rights by way of contract, for instance, through mandatory waiver of rights to enter into routine business contracts um, or to take a job, uh, mandatory arbitration and juryless settlements. Um, these have um, taken the place of what are um, declared in the Bill of Rights 
um, to be fundamental unalienable rights of the citizens. Um, corporate rights is in this category. Um, the idea that property itself can have rights. The denial of legal standing to appear in court without a property claim. You can't sue unless you have some particular material interest um, at stake. I'm not saying that there are no um, civil rights lawsuits, but the vast majority of litigation in the United States um, has to do uh, with property interests. And, and to have legal standing, you must have um, a property or a fiduciary interest at stake. Um, subordination of local governments through state preemption. Um, legal bias in favor of the property rights of creditors against the human rights of debtors. Uh, the dictatorship of precedent over justice. And so um, if in the past um, a bigoted judge made a decision and all future judges must follow that um, precedent, um, that establishes uh, a method for maintaining the status quo, even if the status quo is not just. Now, there are certain there are certainly good reasons to hold on to precedent when it uh, maintains um, just outcomes, um, but that is not always the basis on which precedent is upheld. Um, and so, remaining mindful of our time, um, I don't want to go too much further with reading here, um, but just to say uh, that that distinction between private property, um, property that you gain through your own effort, whether it's um, using your own muscles and, and or your own brain power, um, cleverness and so forth, um, as distinct from uh, property that is gained uh, by conquest. It's interesting, I think, that the Vatican just this past week um, repudiated the doctrine of discovery. Uh, many of you may be familiar with the doctrine of discovery. Um, and it was the legal justification for colonization, for taking land for indig from indigenous people, claiming it to belong to the colonizers and um, and saying that we have a right to it, these folks don't. Uh, it, in the 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 law the the whole idea of uh, the the doctrine of discovery and the law of conquest um, justified genocide, justified ecocide, uh, justified um, saying that the law only protected certain interests, not everyone's. Uh, and that's a model that our law in the United States, like it or not, um, is emulate, it, it emulates it. Um, as recently, well, uh, I won't get into specific uh, lawsuits, but um, Justice Ginsburg, um, uh, who uh, recently uh, passed away, um, actually invoked the doctrine of discovery in a case before the Supreme Court. Uh, and it has been invoked um, to justify uh, the treatment of indigenous Americans um, regularly over the years since establishment of the United States. So what I'm saying about uh, um, the idea of precedent and stare decisis, decisions that have made in the past shouldn't be overturned. Um, it's about maintaining a status quo uh, and there are certain interested parties that need that status quo to be maintained because it, in essence, um, it continues privileges rather than uh, maintaining a system of justice. Uh, there are certain privileges uh, that are jealously protected and have been for generations. And, and this is a legacy that has had a direct impact on what we can do today in the 21st century in the communities where we live. Um, why is it that we can't actually make decisions and enforce those decisions and say, we're going to protect this place? Um, our environmental laws tell us that we can regulate how much harm is done to the environment, but we can't interfere with commerce. We can't interfere with the constitutional civil rights of corporate property um, in the protection of our local environments. And yet here we are approaching what the sixth great extinction and a climate crisis that everyone is scrambling for a way 
to solve that isn't going to impact our quality of life. In other words, our economy. Um, and there are reasons for that. We're allowed to consider any solution to our problems that does not interfere with commerce, with the economy, with the accumulation of wealth. Um, that's the assertion um, that this book is making. Um, and it's not making it just uh, because I don't like rich people. Um, there are fine rich people and there are fine poor people. And it's not about the quality of the people. It's about a system of decision making. And so I want to be clear about that as well. It's not even about corporations, good or bad. Um, corporations are tools. You know, a hammer is a tool. We can do good things we, with it. We can do destructive things with it. Um, same with corporations. Um, but in a, in a society, um, that touts itself as um, being, you know, of the people and for the people, you know, borrowing from Lincoln's words, and being about a republic and representative democracy and so forth. Um, I think that it, to me, it's justified to demand the system actually lives up to at least some portion of that that self-made reputation. So let me pause for a moment. And um, I see we're, we're getting down to only about 15 minutes or so left and I should be quiet. And, and let's see if we have some comments and questions. Any thoughts? Anything um, that you're not sure hit the mark is, is true. Anything that you're not um, sure you agree with, is there something that you do agree with or that some observation you wanna make about your attempts to organize in your community and protect your local rights? Um, because those things are important to share as well. What have you experienced? What have you witnessed? Thoughts? It's a real thing, what I'm getting at. Um, the, when we talk about, uh, some of you are probably familiar if you know our work, uh, Grant Township in Pennsylvania. They've been resisting the siting of a uh, frack waste injection well. This is a small community um, of, well, less than a thousand people. And they get their drinking water from wells that are sunk in the ground from their aquifers. And they think that it's a really terrible idea uh, for the fracking industry to pipe toxic waste that includes radioactive material that's been dredged up from deep down in the ground and pushing that back into the same ground from which they get their drinking water. We're going into the 10th year of litigation in Grant Township. Um, the issue being, um, well, depending on which part of the litigation you look at, uh, certainly one of the uh, issues that was brought up by PGE Corporation um, was the corporation's constitutional rights. Um, and its right to engage in this activity um, because corporations are persons in the eyes of the Supreme Court and have certain constitutional protections. Um, as well, um, the preemption authority of the state has been invoked to say that the Oil and Gas Act in oh, Pennsylvania sorry. prohibits the um, the municipality from enacting laws that that uh, forbid the corporation from citing this injection well, um, and it's not the state bringing that law against the community against the municipality. It is instead um, the corporation invoking that state law and insisting that the state enforce that law on its behalf. When I think about that, I think 
it's actually a corporation, certainly wealthier than this little municipality in Indiana County. Um, and invoking state preemption and saying the state should go to court um, and yes, argue um, that the interests of the corporation supersede the interest of the people and the municipality uh, because the state says so. Um, that's a um, that's a dynamic that you wouldn't expect in a representative democracy. Um, we're used to calling this one, um, and maybe we're used to um, saying that a representative democracy does not include self determination at the community level. But it's not something that the American revolutionaries would would have agreed with at all. Hey Ben, um, yeah. apparently. Two hands were raised. We didn't see them. So if those people want to um, talk, uh, raise their question, please do now. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, Ben, uh, I just have a question about, I was just reading something and I hadn't thought about it this way, about um, patents. And then a patent is a form of property also, but and it's interesting that a patent requires a name of a person. So in essence, I guess it would start out as personal property, but then most corporations, as I understand it, own patents, so somehow it gets transferred. So does that make it privileged property then? And uh, just one of your thoughts on, on the nature of patents. It's a complex area and, you know, oh, uh, attorneys working on, on property issues um, oh, probably pull their hair out over it. Um, but yeah, when you talk about um, patents and copyright, um, look, certainly, okay, so this book has a copyright on it and, you know, my name's on the copyright. I have a right to it. Uh, but copyrights are, are not forever. Um, things go into the public domain after a certain number of years unless the copyright is renewed. Um, and, uh, you know, that's done, um, in essence, it's done as a way to preserve the author's interest in a work, to say, well, they should have the first dibs on it, whatever um, value there is in the thing, uh, but they don't have an eternal interest in it. Um, and so uh, when I said that uh, property exists only in the eyes of the law. It's not an actual thing that can be found um, in, um, you know, in the physical world. If, if we think about um, nations and their borders and property lines and the rest of it, um, we look at photos from outer space and none of that's there. It doesn't look like a Rand McNally globe with lines all over it and showing you where, oh, here's Chad and here's Ethiopia, here's the United States and here's Mexico. Um, oh, and here's, um, you know, Ben's property line and here's um, John's property line and none of that's there. Where those property thing, those claims of property exist are in law and in, you know, in, on paper, in deeds, in titles and in the minds of people who believe that those pieces of paper have meaning. Um, oh, and by the way, in the threat of violence behind um, any claim that you have a right to violate those rights, um, you know, and the state. When I when I say the threat of violence, this the state saying we will um, fine you, we will jail you, we will whatever um, up the ante. Um, that's that's what gives property its value, its actual uh, empirical existence. Um, and so a patent is in the same category. Um, and, and I'm not saying all of that is wrong or evil. The community can come together and say, it makes sense. We should agree that for a certain time, um, a person who creates or invents something should um, be able to claim um, the right to the benefits from it. Just like if I grow the corn, I should have the right to the benefits from the crop. Um, but that doesn't mean you get to have every, every crop of corn that ever is going to be grown from now into the future on that land necessarily. Um, it's the community that comes to agreement on it. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, next up, yeah. is it Will? 
Will, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, ben, Bill and I are both uh, members of the Columbus Community Bill of Rights. And as you are familiar, uh, we've had some struggles here in trying to do things that would protect our watershed. And when uh, being a retired person, I dedicate a good portion of my day uh, you know, getting on the computer and on the internet and just trying to learn what's going on in the world. And it's overwhelming uh, the condition of chaos that we have, not just in, in, in the world, but, you know, more specifically here in this country. Uh, an example of one of the things that we've got met with is that there is going to be an enormous intel factory and complex built just outside the city limits of of columbus and this came as just as a surprise nobody saw it you know most people did not see it coming now the negative thing about that is that the uh unbelievable demand uh, that factory is going to have on our water source uh it, i mean estimates of like three million gallons a day or something along that line and you know i don't know that 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 we're equipped to, to do that and furthermore we've got uh um you know these wells um that are situated in our watershed that they're filling up with you know the toxic frac waste and and uh uh so there's a threat there i i i guess the point i'm trying to make is when i look at everything particularly the, you know the the works of government i really spend a lot of time wondering how we're going to break through and stop that because it's i mean it's we don't have a democracy in this country you know we should even quit talking about it and, you know, I'd agree that we don't have a democracy. Um, should we quit talking about it? Well, we should talking about stop talking like we do have one. I, right. I think. Um, right. And when it comes to um, a private use of a public uh, good, like our, our aquifers, our water, um, the privatization of the commons, or, or they called it in England, the enclosure movement, um, was about the crown raising money um, to fight foreign wars um, and running out of money. And how do I replenish my money and build my army? Um, gee, we have a situation like that in this country today, too. How do we build more and more armaments to sell them around the world um, and stay on top of things? Um, and the answer is you do, you do favors for your wealthy friends so that they will fund your um, excursions in other countries. What kind of favors can you do them? Well, you can look around and you can see, for instance, the national parks. I'll use the United States today as, an, as a comparison to the British enclosure movements. Uh, national and state parks today. How can we say thank you to um, energy producers for keeping the U.S. dollar afloat? Um, well, we could allow them to drill on public lands, to put wells in the, um, you know, well pads in the Allegheny uh, National Forest, in the state forest, and, and in the city parks. Um, that's essentially what happened in England uh, during the enclosures. What happened was that um, wealthy barons said, um, your, yeah, your highness, here's some money for you. Um, and I could sure use an estate. Um, and so the king looks around and says, um, this circle here, this area of land here, I'm drawing a line around it. This now belongs to Baron so-and-so. The commoners that live here um, can either stay and be serfs, in other words, um, indentured servant slaves, um, or they can get out but they can't stay and use the land as the, they have for generations and generations. They can't act um, the same way in the United States. These Native Americans can't stay here and live as they have uh, for eons. They have to get out of here because 
we're taking this land and giving it to the railroads or we're giving it to the mining corporations or we're giving it to. Um, and the reason that uh, that a nation state um, gives title to land to some uh, subjects, you know, a corporation, for instance, um, is to expand the empire. You do it by creating more and more privatized property that can then be taxed and then can be used to um, uphold the central government and its projects and its wars. Um, it's it's not a new model. Um, I'm sorry, Laurie, you have your hand up. And you want? Yeah, so um, I'm kind of um, hearing a story of infiltration, you know, that post-revolution, um, I don't know if this is a legend, but it, King George said they may have thought they got their in, um, independence, but we will gain the control through the banking system. And that, uh, and that there was an amendment, uh, constitutional amendment, and it was against foreign influence targeting the British. And when 1812, somehow the British disappeared, that amendment. <laughs> And there was a different one made for the same number. And, you know, somebody has said, you know, that Wall Street is just a subsidiary of the, you know, the British uh, banking system. Um, but fast, fast forward, or there's a similar movement of education of the law and what went wrong where, but it was like that there were, uh, in addition to the constitution with the, uh, three branches of government that there were local assemblies and that these local assemblies functioned up until a certain point and then they kind of disappeared from history and memory and uh, common usage and things like that so it seems like there's a very concerted you know with a uh, type of a uh, Manicuring the you know mind control the perception of people are born into environment and we're swimming in it like fish and it's like well it's always been like this or uh, have amnesia and you don't don't know the history and uh, yeah so then any anyway and so there's groups right now trying to restart assemblies around in, at a county level. And I, I think that that's a, an interesting and a valuable idea. Um, it was actually the uh, colonial assemblies, the local assemblies um, that sent delegates to the Continental Congress um, and called on the Congress to uh, declare a separation from the British Empire. It wasn't Thomas Jefferson who sat down and was the first to think, gee, let's put together this new document, uh, this Declaration of Independence. Um, there's, um, there's a book um, called um, American Scripture, and it is about the Declaration of Independence. Uh, and it talks about there were over 90 local community assemblies that sent delegates to the Continental Congress instructing them uh, to declare a separation and independence from the empire. Um, that's where it started. It was local community uh, assemblies and generally what we would call county level. Counties were somewhat different then in, in different states or different colonies. They were um, uh, different in size and so forth. New England, um, we still have uh, the town meeting structure, especially in New Hampshire, um, where uh, they aren't municipal corporations as they are in other states. Um, they're people's assemblies, um, and they have a different legal standing. Um, and that's that's true. There's a real story to be told there. And the idea that that somehow uh, the American Revolution didn't actually sever um, our relationship to that aristocratic top-down form of government, um, I, I would argue is true. Um, the Federalists who created the second constitution, the one under which we suffer now, um, mm -hmm. they were um, looking to create a new aristocracy. And the way they did it 
was not by vesting special privileges in a bloodline, as was done in England, but in vesting those special privileges in wealth itself, by placing the extra privileges in the property, the extra wealth itself, so that whoever came into possession of it then uh, benefited from those extra, um, those extra privileges. And I'll give you an example. I know we're just, we're at the end here, but um, Ben Franklin uh, lived in Pennsylvania and he was involved in the creation of the first um, constitution for the new state of Pennsylvania. And it was um, the rabble that um, came into Philadelphia. When I say the rabble, I mean the farmers, not the well-to-do, not the Quaker um, kind of commercial class that was running Pennsylvania as a colony under the Penn family. Um, they were rousted out of the assembly in Philadelphia by the commoners who came to town and said, um, we're fed up. Uh, we're not allowed to vote because we don't own land. We're not allowed to hold office because we don't own land. Um, and we don't like this suffering under the British yoke and we need to declare independence. And you folks, including John Dickinson, you know, for whom Dickinson College in Carlisle was named, was opposed to independence. He was one of the Federalists who wrote the constitution. He opposed independence and the, the Quaker uh, folks that um, we have lots of legends and stories about them, but um, they uh, opposed independence. And when the commoners came to town in Philadelphia en masse and surrounded what became the constitutional uh, uh, gathering place, you know, Constitution Hall, um, upstairs um, was the General Assembly for Pennsylvania. Um, they surrounded it and they, and they threatened people. Eventually the delegates for, from the assembly in Pennsylvania um, snuck off and said, we're not going back there. We don't want to get killed. The commoners took over. They passed a resolution, sent it to the Continental Congress, called for independence. And that's what triggered a cascade of other states, other new colonies um, joining in the call for independence. And that is what um, really um, uh, was what, what uh, motivated the writing of the National Declaration. Um, it was local communities and state assemblies and county assemblies sending instructions. It was the local governments. Today we're told they have no authority. They're completely subordinate um, to the state and you know, Municipalities aren't even mentioned in the federal constitution. They're not recognized as a form of government. And the people there have no citizenship at the town or community level, only at the state and the federal level. Um, that's something worth exploring. It's worth digging into how we have a form of government that touts the idea that it follows through on the revolutionary idea of recognizing the people's authority to govern and to determine their own fate in the communities where they live, that now the government that has been developed following that revolution does not recognize the people's right to use that local government for their own self-governing purposes. And if you think you can control your state legislatures, I'd like to know who your lobbyists are. Mm. Yeah, so there are uh, a number of more comments in in the chat now, but also two questions that I think haven't been answered yet. And they're both uh, questions of, isn't there a place in upstate New York to ban fracking? And then also, did Pittsburgh ban fracking? Yes, Pittsburgh ban fracking. I, I helped uh, develop that and campaign for that ban in 2010. It's still in the books. It has not been challenged. Um, and why has Pittsburgh's ban on fracking not been challenged, even though they violated state preemption by passing that ban? Um, well, because it's a big place. It's, it's not Grand Township with less than a thousand people. Um, so it's about power. It's about clout. Uh, and the question I have is, should it be about power and clout or should people be able to, um, to create just outcomes, even if they aren't? a 
powerhouse politically? Shouldn't that justice um, be distributed to all? Uh, but maybe yeah, and, that means places like Pittsburgh can set a precedent. Well, um, there hasn't been a legal case in Pittsburgh, so no precedent comes out of it, Beth. Um, and so um, it certainly sets an example and other communities have followed suit in Pennsylvania and elsewhere uh, to ban it. And Grant Township is one of them and many others have as well uh, banned um, the act of um, fracking and the waste, um, the waste wells. Others have not. And frankly, the industries are happy to go to the communities where people don't put up a fight because then they don't have to spend any money on uh, lawyers. Um, and what was the other? I'm sorry, was there something else? Oh, there? upstate New York, uh, there's a municipality or political entity up there that banned fracking. Wales, New York enacted one of the ordinances that I worked with Wales, New York to pass a community bill of rights that bans fracking and recognizes the rights of the ecosystem locally. Um, in, in New York State, um, we have Patrick Burke, who is an assembly member from the Buffalo area in the state <clears throat> legislature. He approached us last year, last year, asked us to write um, a Great Lakes Bill of Rights for him. Uh, we did. Uh, he has introduced it into the state legislature. Um, and so it, it does have some co-sponsors. Um, it has not come out of committee. It has not had hearings. Uh, but we're we're working on putting together a campaign uh, to get some, um, you know, to get some air under those wings. See if we can get that thing flying and get communities in New York to support it. Um, there's a lot. There are a lot of stories I can tell you, but we are pretty much down to the time here. We will be getting back together again in May and the exact date will be coming out. Um, you can read the next section on that landing page uh, for um, this event, How Wealth Rules, on the CELDIF website. Um, so the next section, part two, uh, is a PDF that's downloadable. You can read it. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, I really appreciate it. And I look forward to further discussions. And thank you. Thanks, Ben. Right. That was great. Thanks, everybody. Yeah.